You know what disappearance wouldn't be all that mysterious? If you're a guy and your hair starts to go missing, what? That's because about two out of every three men will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35. And once it's gone, gentlemen, it's not coming back. I know that. Fortunately, this video is sponsored by Keeps, which is going to help you keep the hair that you still have. I wish Keeps had been around when I was younger, since advancements in science meant that there are now treatments that can combat the symptoms of hair loss and help you keep the hair that you have. It's too late for me. My hair isn't coming back, but you don't have to be like me. You can stop your hair loss early thanks to Keeps. Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA-approved drugs treating hair loss, so you may have tried them before, but never at a price this low. That's right, if you were thinking, well, this is some sort of medicine. So it's gonna be mad expensive. Well, you couldn't be more wrong. Keep starts at just $10 a month. How does it work? Well, for one thing, there's no need to visit a doctor's office. Just schedule a quick online consult and a bit later, a discreet package will arrive at your door and you use it in the privacy of your own home. So if you're noticing that you're losing your hair, that's one problem that's not gonna fix itself. Do something about it. For a limited time, go to keeps.com forward slash top tens or click the link in the description below to receive 50% off your first order. And now today's video. Every now and then we could use a reminder that a lot of mysteries do get solved given enough time and effort. In the past, we've examined a few disappearances that seem like they would remain cold cases forever, but they were ultimately elucidated. Now it's time to take a look at a few more, and some of them are even more bizarre than the first. Number 8. The Captain Who Was Captured by Pirates Born in 1702 in Marblehead, Massachusetts, Philip Ashton took to life on the open sea as a child. Therefore, nobody was surprised when he grew up to become a ship's captain. In 1722, he commanded a crew of six aboard a schooner named Milton, which he sailed to the Grand Banks of Newfoundland to fish for cod. In Port Roseway, Milton was approached by a merchant vessel, and Ashton realized only too late that the men who boarded his ship were pirates in disguise. And just like that, Ashton found himself a captive of Ned Lowe, one of the most sadistic pirates to ever sail the seven seas. Even so, Ashton resisted all enticements to join Lowe's crew. The following year, Ashton was still a prisoner when the pirate ship landed on Roten Island in the Caribbean to collect water. He was taken too short to work, and when he saw his opportunity, Philip Ashton ran into the thick jungle. Eventually, the pirates left without him. The island was completely uninhabited, and with the former captain basically marooning himself with no supplies, no food, not even any shoes, they assumed it would be the last time that anyone ever heard of Philip Ashton. Well, that turned out not to be the case, because he somehow survived 16 months on the desert island until he was found by some English baymen who lived in Honduras. Bashton lived with them until a brig from Massachusetts called the Diamond visited Honduras Bay, at which point the former fisherman finally secured passage home, arriving almost three years after being captured by the pirates. Number 7. The Air Force Officer Who Deserted in the early 1980s, Captain William Howard Hughes Jr. was an important officer with the U.S. Air Force who had top-secret single-scope background investigation clearance. Then, in July 1983, he disappeared after returning from a business trip to Europe. None of his friends or family members had any clue what had happened to him, so in December of that same year, he was officially declared a deserter. The commonly held belief at the time was that Hughes had either been kidnapped by the Soviets or had willingly defected to their side. One intelligence officer said that Hughes would have been worth his weight in gold to the Russians, and in fact, he was later investigated as a possible saboteur for several rocket ship launch failures, including the infamous Challenger disaster. As it turned out, Hughes did not sabotage any rocket ships, nor did he defect to Russia. He had just started a new life in California. For 35 years, he lived as Barry O'Byrne, although everyone called him Tim. His neighbors all thought he was a pleasant man who loved the San Francisco Giants and had no clue about his troubled past. Hughes was finally found out while being investigated in a passport fraud investigation. Some of his statements didn't make sense, so eventually he came clean about his true identity. As to why he did it, Hughes put it down to depression about being in the Air Force and just wanting a simpler life. Number 6. The Screenwriter with the Missing Hands For three decades, Gary DeVore worked as a scriptwriter in Hollywood, beginning his career with shows from the 1960s such as The Newlywed Game and The Steve Allen Show before specializing in action movies such as Raw Deal, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. In 1997, he was working on a remake of a 1940s film titled The Big Steel and had just wrapped up some business in New Mexico. He jumped into his Ford Explorer and headed back home to Los Angeles, but he was never seen alive again. DeVore's publicist thought this was all some kind of publicity stunt. His wife wasn't 
convinced, and she contacted the police and put out a $100,000 reward and even enlisted the help of a psychic. But all efforts proved to be in vain, as nobody could find Gary DeVore. The mystery of his disappearance was solved in 1998, but if anything, it only raised more questions. An amateur sleuth found his Ford Explorer in a California aqueduct, with the screenwriter's body in the driver's seat. At first glance, it appeared to be an accident, except for a few little details. There were no signs of impact. Police had already checked the aqueduct during their initial search, and the writer's laptop and gun had been taken from the vehicle. Also, his hands were missing. Gary DeVore's death was ruled a murder, but the solution remains as elusive as ever. Number 5. The Teenager Who Hid in the Cupboard in August 1998, 14-year-old Natasha Ryan from Rockhampton, Queensland, Australia, went missing after her mother dropped her off at school. Even worse, during the investigation into her disappearance, it was believed that she became a victim of a suspected serial killer, Leonard Fraser, known as the Rockhampton Rapist. Fast forward to 2003 during Fraser's trial. By this point, even though Ryan's body had never been found, everyone was convinced that she'd been killed by Fraser, mainly because he had confessed to the deed on tape. But as it turns out, not only did he not kill her, but Natasha Ryan wasn't even dead. Police had executed a raid on the home of Scott Black, Ryan's former boyfriend, and they found the missing teenager hiding in the cupboard. Understandably, the girl's family was shocked when they found out that Natasha was still alive. They were even more shocked when they discovered that she had been living less than two miles away all that time. For almost five years, Ryan did not leave her boyfriend's apartment. She even had to spend hours at a time hiding in the cupboard when he had friends or family over. As to why she did it, she simply said that the lie had become too big. Number 4. The Girl Who Went to North Korea on November the 15th, 1977, 13-year-old Megumi Yokota finished badminton practice at her school and was headed back to her home in Nagata, Japan. Even though she only lived a few minutes away, that time was all it took for Megumi to vanish without a trace. A search party looked everywhere from the forest to the shoreline, but could find no signs of a fight, a struggle, or a witness who may have seen what had happened to the young girl. In the year that followed, a special kidnapping unit set up shop in the Yokota house and dedicated thousands of man-hours towards solving the mystery of Megumi Yokota's disappearance appearance, but there was no success. It wasn't until two decades later that the Yagota family received a shocking phone call from an official that they had never met or spoken to, and he told them, we have information that your daughter is alive in North Korea. As it turns out, both the Japanese and South Korean governments had been tipped off for years that North Korea was responsible for many kidnappings of their citizens, but were hesitant to act on that information. The story of Megumi Yokota was first told by a defecting North Korean spy who said that she was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. The young girl had spotted two agents who were waiting for a pickup boat and fearing that their cover might be blown, they abducted her and took her to North Korea. There she was taught Korean and forced to teach Japanese language and behavior at a spy school. It wasn't until 2000 2002, during a historic meeting between Kim Jong-il and Japanese Prime Minister Yunichiro Koizumi that North Korea admitted the deed. They claimed responsibility for 13 kidnappings, though many believe the number is much higher. They also claimed that only five of the 13 were still alive. Unfortunately for the Yokota family, Megumi was not among them. Their story was that Megumi Yokota had committed suicide in 1994 due to depression, but her family remains convinced that this is just another lie. Number 3. The Message That Said Stendets ETA Santiago, 1745 hours, Stendetz. This was the last communication sent in Morse code on August the 2nd, 1947, by an Avro 691 Lancaster aircraft flying for British South American Airways from Buenos Aires, Argentina to San Diego, Chile. The airship was a four-engine plane given the name Stardust and was carrying 11 people on board, crew included. The message had been sent at 5.41 p.m., suggesting that it was four minutes away from landing right on schedule, except that it never landed. Despite an extensive search at the time, the wreckage of the plane could not be found, and the fate of the Stardust became a mystery for over half a century. During that time, several ideas were put forward as to what had happened to the airplane and its passengers. This was just a few weeks after the Roswell incident, so obviously some people thought that it had to be aliens. The biggest piece of the puzzle was the last word of the Morse code, Stendetz. What was that supposed to mean? At first, the airport operator thought it was an error, but the radio operator aboard the Stardust repeated it twice. A lot of people noticed that Stendetz is an anagram of descent. A fault with the oxygen supply could have led to the crew suffering from hypoxia, which could have caused the operator to unwittingly send a scrambled message. Others think that it was simply a mistake, and that he wanted to send Stardust, which is similar to Standards in Morse code. Both ideas are plausible, but unlikely, given that the operator used the word three times. A possible hypothesis is that Standards was a World War II acronym that meant Severe Turbulence Encountered, Now Descending, Emergency Crash Landing. 
Message aside, we finally found out what happened to the Stardust in 1998 when a group of Argentinian mountaineers stumbled upon the wreckage when climbing Mount Tumungato. Subsequently, they found a lot of human remains which had been well preserved with ice and DNA tests confirmed their identity. It seems that the Stardust crashed into terrain during a controlled descent due to the plane getting caught up in a snowstorm while flying against the jet stream. It smashed right into the side of a glacier, which caused an avalanche that buried the wreckage under tons of snow. Number 2. The Man Who Forgot Who He Was Back in 2016, Edgar Latterlip was a middle-aged man living in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada, who had been having these strange sensations all of a sudden that he was living somebody else's life. He tried to explain this unusual feeling to a social worker who decided to Google his name and was stunned to discover that Edgar Latterlip had been the target of a missing persons investigation for 30 years. That sensation Edgar was experiencing was him getting his memories back. In 1986, the then 21-year-old Edgar Latterlip lived lived in Kitchener, Ontario, in a group home. One day, he boarded a bus to Niagara Falls and was never seen again. Latterlip suffered from both developmental delays and suicidal tendencies, so his family feared that he died at the falls either following an accident or a suicide. What had actually happened was that Latterlip somehow sustained a head injury that was serious enough to cause massive memory loss. When he recovered, he traveled to nearby St. Catharines, where he began his second life just 80 miles away from his first one. Number 1. The Man Who Testified at His Own Murder Trial we end with the most bizarre case in our video today, that of an Arkansas man who vanished, was presumed murdered, and then showed up alive and well at his killer's trial. And it only got more complicated from there. We begin in January 1929, when a man named Connie Franklin showed up in the town of St. James, Stone County, Arkansas. Soon enough, he found work as a farmhand and started a romance with a local girl named Tilla Rumina. By March, the two of them were ready to get married, and that was when Franklin disappeared. A few months later, the young woman approached the police with a shocking story. She claimed that four local men had attacked her and Franklin while they were on their way to the office of the Justice of the Peace. They dragged the couple into the woods, where they raped Rumina and then beat, tortured, and burned Connie Franklin alive. They then threatened to kill the girl's entire family if she went to the police. Unfortunately, there was no evidence to support her story, so a grand jury refused to indict the four men. It wasn't until November 1929 that the trial moved forward when a woman found a pile of ashes in the woods which contained bones that were believed to be human. The case took a strange turn in December when Connie Franklin showed up at his own murder trial with a vastly different story to that of his former fiancé. He claimed that he got drunk in celebration the night before his marriage. The following day, Tiller got cold feet. He basically told her it was now or never, and when she refused to go through with it, he simply left town. Now it's time for the second twist, because Tilla Rumina, her father, and a few other locals claimed that the new man was not the real Connie Franklin. And they were half right in the sense that he wasn't the man he pretended to be. His real name was Marion Franklin Rogers. He was already married with three children, and he had escaped in 1927 from a mental hospital. Of course, none of this indicated that he was not the same person who arrived in St. James back in January, just that he lied about his past. The town was split on whether this man was the same Connie Franklin as the first one, but ultimately there wasn't strong enough evidence to convict, so the four men were acquitted of the murder. So I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Thank you again to Keeps for sponsoring. You can check them out through the link in the description below. And one other thing you might want to check out if you enjoyed today's video, or really just true crime content in general, is a podcast that I do called The Casual Criminalist that publishes twice every week. So if you're looking for more content from me, that's definitely one place to go. It's both a podcast and a YouTube channel, and there are links provided below.